the first uh, series that uh, we are doing at East Plano Islamic Center. And my series, inshallah ta'ala, will always be at this time slot, Wednesday evening. Uh, the exact timing will depend on Maghrib and Isha. But basically, Wednesday evening after work, this is our regular slot for our lectures throughout the year. The reason being that weekends typically are busy, things happen. I travel, you travel. So we have a Wednesday where everybody knows, inshallah, in the evening time after they come home from work, they'll be able to come and uh, take a regular series. And inshallah, uh, we will be having different uh, topics, miscellaneous topics, but it'll always be a series. And I wanted to start off with one of the fundamental pillars of our faith, of our theology, and that is belief in Judgment Day and the signs of Judgment Day. What is called in Arabic, Ashrat al saa the signs of Judgment Day. Now, the concept of Judgment Day and the signs of Judgment Day is something that is actually mentioned in the most fundamental hadith of our religion, that's the hadith of Jibreel. The famous hadith of Jibreel, when Jibreel came and quizzed the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, quizzed the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what is Islam, what is Iman, what is Ihsan? One of the questions Jibreel asked him is what? One of the questions Jibreel asked him is, when is the day of judgment? Mata sa'a? And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, I don't know, you don't know. Mal mas'ulu anha bi'alama min as-sa'il. Then Jibreel said, فَأَخْبِرْنِي عَنْ عَلَامَاتِهَا Inform me about the signs of Judgment Day. Inform me about the signs of Judgment Day. Now the very fact that Jibreel is asking this question, when the time is limited, the occasion is auspicious, only once in the entire seerah did Jibreel come down in public so that everybody could see. This never happened before, never happened again. And every question is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The very fact that Jibreel is coming down and asking these questions. Remember, Jibreel does not come because he wants to. وَمَا نَتَنَزَّلُ إِلَّا بِأَمْرِ رَبِّكَ Allah has sent Jibreel. And at the end of the hadith, what did the Prophet ﷺ say? Do you know who that was? No. He was Jibreel who came to teach you. To teach you what? Your religion. Which means every single question that was asked was a fundamental question of the religion. Otherwise, it would not have been asked. If Jibreel had not asked those questions, every question is of the fundamentals. And one of the questions, tell me about the signs of Judgment Day. This indicates that the signs of Judgment Day are an integral part of our faith, or else it would not have been come here. And that is why the genre of writing books about Judgment Day goes back to the earliest of times. Every major collection of hadith from Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, Abu Dawood. In fact, many muhaddithin wrote special books. Of them is Nu'im ibn Habmad. He wrote a multi-volume book called Kitab al-Fitani wa Ashrat al-Sa'a. The Signs of Judgment Day, an entire encyclopedia written in the 3rd century or 4th century of the Hijra. And from that time onwards, many, many books have been written. And not only have books been written, our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam dedicated special classes for the signs of Judgment Day. How do we know? Abu Zayd al-Ansari narrates in Sahih Muslim. Listen to this very interesting narration. One day, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prayed Fajr with us. And then he climbed on the mimbar, which was not his habit. He didn't climb on the mimbar after Fajr. He climbed on the mimbar. فَخَطَبَنَا إِلَى الظُّهْرِ and he gave us a lecture until Salat al-Dhuhr. Then he came down and he prayed Dhuhr with us. Then he went up and he spoke until Asr. He came down, he prayed Asr with us. He went up and he spoke until Maghrib. Essentially, almost non-stop. We can assume there were smaller breaks, but the point is one full day class was given from Fajr until Maghrib. What was the topic of that? Abu Zayd al-Ansari said, فَعَلَّمَنَا بِمَا هُوَ كَائِنٌ إِلَى يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ He taught us what would happen until the day of judgment. He taught us what would happen until judgment day. And the most knowledgeable of us about signs of judgment day is the one who had the best hifth and memorized the most on that day. This hadith is in Sahih Muslim, the most authentic book after Bukhari. So there was a class that the Prophet ﷺ gave from Fajr until Maghrib about the signs of Judgment Day. How else do we know? Other Sahaba were present. 
the famous Sahabi, Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman, the one who kept the secret of the Prophet Sallallahu he said, one day the Prophet ﷺ gave us a khutbah in which he didn't forget to mention anything until the day of judgment. He mentioned everything that will happen. So Hudayfa is there, he's putting it in his own words that one day he gave us a lecture about everything that would happen. The same that Abu Zayd al Ansari said. You know, when two people attend the same lecture, they'll narrate to you the gist, but there'll be slight differences. So Hudayfa is saying the Prophet ﷺ gave us a khutbah, a lecture that he taught us everything until the day of judgment that would happen and then he said alimahu man alimahu wa jahilahu man jahilahu whoever knows it knows it whoever doesn't doesn't whoever remembers those remembers whoever doesn't doesn't and then he said something interesting he said and sometimes i see something happening in my life and it reminds me of something that i had forgotten that the prophet said on that day just like one of you doesn't see his friend for many months, doesn't think about him. Then he sees his friend or acquaintance and he says, where have you been? So he remembers he had an acquaintance, you know, there you have your close circle of friends, then you have your 100 or 200 acquaintances. You know, you don't really keep in touch. So suppose somebody of that acquaintance goes missing for a week or two. Then you see him in the masjid. Oh, Akhi, where have you been? In that week, you didn't remember him. But when you see him, you remember him. This is what Hudayfa is saying. Sometimes I see something and I forgot that I had heard about it before. But when I see it happening, I remember that is what the Prophet ﷺ said. And this is why when Umar ibn al-Khattab in his Khilafah, he asked, who amongst you knows what the Prophet ﷺ said about the end of times, it was Hudayfa who responded. There's a famous conversation, we'll get to it later on. It was Hudayfa. Why do you, why do you concern yourself with it, Ya Amir al muminin Don't you know there's a closed door? You're not going to see those signs. Umar said, will that door open with a key or will it be broken? Will it be smashed? And Hudayfa said, it will be smashed, it will be broken. That was the prediction that Umar would die a shaheed. He wouldn't die a natural death. But what did Hudayfa say? Why are you worried, O Amir al Mu'minin? You're not going to see all of those things. That's going to be before your time. You will be gone. Notice, Hudayfa said to Umar radiallahu anhu, You're not going to see the fitan between the Sahaba. I mean, he didn't say that phrase, but you get the point. You're not going to see the, you know, the, 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 the zalazil, the fitan, the mihan. You're not going to see all of those signs. Why are you worried about them? So he said, What is that door that's going to be between me and it? Is it a natural door or it is going to be broken open? He said, No, it's going to be broken. And this was the prediction that Umar ibn Khattab would die a death of a shaheed. How did Hudayfa know this is of those things that the Prophet is mentioning? In cryptic language, he didn't say, after me will be Abu Bakr, he will die a natural death, then will be Umar, he will die. No, but he is speaking in a language that the intelligent Sahaba understand. So Hudayfa understands roughly what era, and that in my era, what the Prophet said is not going to happen, and therefore Umar radiallahu anh will not live to see it, but he will die the death of a shaheed, and so on and so forth. So, in today's series of lectures, today's our first day, we'll continue inshallah next week, then I will be uh, departing for Hajj, then we'll resume after Hajj inshallah maybe four maybe six I don't know how many lessons we'll have inshallah about the signs of judgment day and we'll go over all of the major and minor signs one after the other in a bit of a detail this is going to be a, a, a detailed series about uh, the signs of judgment day and also inshallah ta'ala our ma major issues we need to discuss Ya'juj and Ma'juj what do we say about them what do we say where are these million people where are they living we have to be very frank how do we talk about these issues okay Dajjal is he alive or dead you know what does he have supernatural power does this mean the Jal is some mystical force or is he an actual entity? These are things that there are theories and I will be frank as is my, my uh, want all the time and inshallah uh, we will inshallah benefit and agree or agree to disagree one of the two inshallah ta'ala. So let us begin. This is the prelude. Why are we studying signs of judgment day? What are the benefits of studying this branch of Islamic theology? Realize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned in the Quran that the day of judgment is very close. Don't think it is far away. It is very close. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that people are quizzing you about 
Judgment day. Yes, alunaka an isa'a. They ask you about judgment day. Allah says, فَقَدْ جَاءَ أَشْرَاطُهَا The signs of judgment day have begun already. The signs have already begun. They're asking you, when is judgment day? I am telling you, the precursors, the flags, the warning flags have already begun. Allah says in the Quran, إِقْتَرَبَتِ السَّاعَةِ The judgment is close. Allah says in the Quran, that إِقْتَرَبَ لِلنَّاسِ حِسَابُهُمْ Allah, that the hisab of mankind is coming closer to closer. Allah Allah says in the Quran, إِنَّهُمْ يَرَوْنَهُ بَعِيدًا وَنَرَاهُ قَرِيبًا They think that judgment day is far away, but we know that it is very, very close. And our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he predicted, and the hadith is in Sahih Muslim, and he put his fingers out like this, and he said, بُعِثْتُ أَنَا وَالسَّاعَةَ كَهَاتَيْنَ That myself and judgment day, we have been sent like this. Now, scholars say, either we have been sent like this, meaning, this is him and this is judgment day. So the difference between your first finger and the second finger, right? Either that or I have been sent to judgment day. So the distance between two fingers. Either one, it's a small amount, right? Either this is the coming of the process and this is judgment day. This is the difference between two. So all of this and all of this, what is the difference? Very little. Or there's a small space between the two fingers. So he's saying, I have been sent and judgment day will come after me. So the coming of the Prophet ﷺ is the beginning of the signs of judgment day. With his coming, with his birth, with his mission, and then with his death wasallam. This is the beginning of judgment day. Or I should say the beginning of the signs of the judgment day. And our Prophet wasallam said, hadith is in Sahih Muslim, that your example, you, O Ummah of Prophet ﷺ, your example of the time that you have compared to the times of the Ummahs before you is like that of a person who has prayed Asr and he's waiting for Maghrib and that will be Judgment Day. You are the people that have prayed Asr and are waiting for Maghrib. Everybody else prayed Fajr, Dhuhr, whatnot. The previous Ummahs were way before you. The time slot between Asr and Maghrib is the shortest. We barely, barely pray Asr. Before we know it, it's Maghrib time. So the Prophet said, your example, O Ummah, is like of the man who prayed Asr and he's done with Asr. He's just waiting for Maghrib. And the previous Ummahs, they are the previous Salawat. And therefore, this, the judgment day and the signs of judgment day are something that make us waken up to the reality of actual Qiyamah. In one hadith in Muslim Imam Ahmad, our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, I was sent along with the day of judgment and I just preceded it. It almost beat me. This is an authentic hadith in Muslim Imam Ahmad. That it is as if Allah sent the both of us together and I just beat the day of judgment by a little bit. So this means, especially given the fact that 1440 years have passed since the Prophet said that, right? So imagine our Prophet said these phrases that I have been sent with judgment day like this and 1,440 years have gone. That is not a joke. That is a millennia and a half. That is a huge step in human history. All of recorded human history does not go back more than three, 4,000 years. The earliest actual records that we have of any civilization are 4,000 years old at max. Yes, we have remnants of people, five, six, seven, eight, but no histories. We don't know the dynasties. We don't know only three, four, five, four thousand 4,000 at max. Of these 4,000, 1,400 is our own ummah. So how about the previous ummahs before? How about the ummahs before the recording? How about the ummahs that go back to Nuh and pre nuh how many tens of thousands of years only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows and now we have just a little bit of time left as Allah Azza wa Jal says in the Quran وَمَا أَمْرُ السَّاعَةِ إِلَّا كَلَمْحِ الْبَصَرِ أَوْ هُوَ أَقْرَبُ The judgment day is like the twinkling of an eye it's like your eye blinking or it is even faster than that and if you look at how long this world has been here billions and billions of years and how long human beings have been here at the very least 40,000 years we homo sapiens have been here at the very least then what is 1,400 years nothing and that's why our Prophet said that I am the first of the sign my death is going to be the first of the major signs not major in that sense but in the sense of beginning the signs of judgment day and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us 
That هَلْ يَنْظُرُونَ إِلَّا السَّاعَةِ Are they waiting for judgment day? فَقَدْ جَاءَ أَشْرَاطُهَا Can't they see the signs of judgment day have already come? The signs of judgment day have already come. And Allah Azza wa Jal mentions that Isa ibn Maryam is also one of the signs of judgment day. وَإِنَّهُ لَعَلَمٌ لِلسَّاعَةِ In one qira'ah, in Surah Zuhru for 61, Isa and the coming of Isa is a flag for judgment day. But this is the second coming of Isa as we're going to come to inshallah ta'ala, not the first coming of Isa. And the Quran also mentions the coming of Ya'juj and Ma'juj. Hatta idha futihat Ya'juj wa Ma'juj. So all of these are signs that are mentioned in the Quran about judgment day. What is the reason why we are studying these signs? Many reasons. Of them, the primary reason is that it makes us appreciate the truthfulness of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When we see things that he could never have known, impossible to know, when we see that he's predicting the future and we are living that future, how can our Iman not go up? How can our Iman not become firm? How can we not have Yaqeen that this man, وَمَا يَنْتِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَىٰ He is not a normal human being in the sense that he is not speaking from his mind. He is speaking from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala who is inspired. Inspiring him. And when we hear of these predictions, when we see the specific, very, very interesting predictions that nobody could have thought of, and he is telling them to us, and we see them before our eyes, then our iman increases in Allah, in the Quran, in the Sunnah. As well, why else are we studying Judgment Day? The signs of Judgment Day, they are like the symptoms of a disease. When you see the symptoms, you should be concerned. You should be concerned. You should take precaution. What happens when your cholesterol level goes up? You start monitoring your food, right? What happens when your sugar level? What happens when your heart beat? You start taking adequate measures to protect yourself. So, what will be the case when you realize that Judgment Day is around the corner, that Qiyamah is coming closer and closer? What are you going to do? You will take precautions. You will become more aware. You will feel, I need to prepare for Qiyamah. So, one of the main factors why we are studying signs of Judgment Day, that it impacts our life. We live better lives so that we are prepared to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the Day of Judgment. So, it is a wake-up call for us that we realize the end is near and we need to prepare ourselves. And of course, of the reasons that we study the signs of Judgment Day as well, is that insha'Allah ta'ala, this gives us a sense of comfort. Let us be brutally honest. Wallahi, we live in depressing times. Let's be honest here. So much is going on that the heart bleeds. What is happening around the world? SubhanAllah, where does one begin? Now you read these hadith, and you realize, you know what? A lot of this has actually been predicted. The very fact that it's been predicted, you know, let me give you an example. If the doctor tells you, you know, you're going to go through some sickness, it's going to go down before it gets better. When it goes down, it's painful. But when the doctors told you it's going to go down, doesn't that knowledge say, you know what the doctor told me? The doctor said it's going to be hard for a week. You know, it's going to be difficult. That, that prediction of the doctor, get my point, that, that forecast, I should say, it gives you a sense of peace. You know what? Okay. The, the end will be better. This is the point. When we study a hadith about judgment day, and these are hadith, they have a lot of you know, warnings, but they also have some good news. They also have some basharat. So those warnings, they're not going to make us depressed. We are prepared. We're mentally prepared, psychologically prepared, emotionally prepared. I need to prepare. And when we see it happening, when we see those trends, our iman goes higher. We turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we feel a sense of comfort that inshallah, Allah will take care of us. Because why do you think our Prophet ﷺ told us these hadith? Why did he tell us that my ummah will be split up? Why did he tell us that this is going to happen, that's going to happen? So that we get depressed? So that we feel down? So that, no! He told us to give us the comfort that we need, to give us the moral support, the encouragement. He told us so that insha'Allah ta'ala, when it happens, we are prepared emotionally and mentally for dealing with those signs of Judgment Day. So these are some of the reasons why we will study the signs of Judgment Day. Jayid, the next subsection. How do we categorize the signs of Judgment Day? There are so many ahadith, so many uh, you know, verses in the Quran, so many traditions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Over a dozen works have been authored in classical Islam. 
By classical, I mean basically pre, uh, let's say pre-1000 Hijri, let's say the first uh, 800, 900 years of the Hijrah, in the early stage of Islam, over a dozen works. Ibn Kathir is one of the most comprehensive. When he wrote his book, Al-Bidaya wa Nihaya, the beginning and the end, he put an entire volume, the end and Nihaya. The entire volume he put for signs of Judgment Day. And many authors before him and after him, they wrote special treatises about the signs of Judgment Day. So when they're looking at all of this material, when they see all of these ahadith in front of them, they try to categorize. And categorization is a well-known science. And how you categorize is all relative. I can categorize everybody in this room based upon gender, male or female. Well, right now, male or female, Allah knows going to happen in a few years anyway. I can also categorize based upon... Uh, um, uh, based upon work, engineer, doctor. I can categorize based upon ethnicity. The same group, different categories, right? Similarly, when it comes to signs of Judgment Day, you have the same ahadith. How do you categorize? It can be different. So, one way to categorize is to categorize it into one of two. Either a specific incident or a general trend. Some predictions, one incident, one off. The Muslim shall conquer Constantinople. Okay, that's a one-off. Okay, uh, in another hadith, the Muslims will conquer Rome. That's a one-off incident. The Dajjal will come. That's a one-off incident. Ya'juj and will be released. That's a one-off incident. This is a one incident. The Mahdi will come. That's another incident. Or you have a trend, a general trend. Ignorance will prevail, for example. Okay, in one hadith, writing will be common. This is a very interesting prediction. Kitaba. Writing will be common. And imagine in a society when the Prophet was sent in Mecca, barely 12 people knew how to read and write. Most of the Sahaba of early Islam were not literate because it wasn't the culture to be literate. They were not literate. And our Prophet said, one of the signs of Judgment Day, the majority of mankind will write. This is a trend, it's not a one-off, right? You see that. One of the signs of Judgment Day is that khamr, alcohol, everybody will be taking drugs and alcohol. It's one of the signs. One of the signs of Judgment Day, immorality, fahisha, that people will be doing it in public or nudity will be in public. This is a trend. It's not a one incident. So these are two ways to categorize a one incident or a uh, trend. And this is something that uh, is very clear. Now, another way to categorize, which is the more common way, and it is the one that we will be uh, using, inshallah, for today and the rest of our series, is to divide the, the signs of Judgment Day into what is called major signs, al-ashrat al-sa'a al-kubra, and minor signs, ashrat al-sughra, major signs and minor signs. And where do we get this from? We get it straight from the hadith of the Prophet wasallam. in that in a number of authentic hadith, he explicitly mentioned that there are going to be 10 major signs of Judgment Day. So by mentioning 10 will be major, automatically this means the rest are going to be minor. Okay, so he is the one who brought forth this categorization that he said there's going to be 10 kubra or kabir signs. And those ones are separate from the rest of them. So the hadith is in Sahih Muslim. The hadith is in Sahih Muslim that our Prophet Wasallam came across the Sahaba one day. They were sitting in the masjid. He came and they were having a heated discussion. So he said to them, what are you discussing? So they said, we are talking about when Qiyamah will happen. We're talking about making a guess. When will Qiyamah happen? So the Prophet Wasallam said, Qiyamah will not happen until you see its 10 signs. So now he said there are 10 signs that are directly linked to Qiyamah. There are 10 that are definitely in a different category. Qiyamah will not happen until you see its 10 signs. Then he mentioned them one by one. And I'm going to quickly list them now. And inshallah, later on in our series, we'll go over each one of them in a lot of detail. Number one, he said, the Dukhan. Dukhan is a dust, smoke, smog. The Dukhan. Number two, uh, and by the way, all ten of these are specific. These are not trends. All ten of these are one-off incidents. So these ten, it is a clear-cut sign. Something major is going to happen. Catastrophic, catastrophic, cataclysmic. And everybody will recognize this is one of those major signs. So number one, the Dukhan. No, and, and this is not in order. We're going to mention this. This is just ten that he said. They don't necessarily be in this order. Number two, the Dajjal. And that is a long discussion. We'll talk about that. Number three, the dab. 
and the dabba is the beast and he's mentioned in the quran uh, وَإِذَا وَقَعَ عَلَيْهِمْ So this is in the Quran. There's something called the dabba or a beast. And by the way, uh, before I move on, so signs of judgment day in every tradition, in every tradition, they are cryptic. They are cryptic. This is one of the things that we find. Even in the conservative Christian movement, even in the Orthodox Jewish movement, this is the genre of of signs of judgment day. In every religious tradition, you have these phrases that might be difficult to unpack. One of the wisdoms might be that you only recognize it after it happens, that, oh, this is what it is referencing. So Allah knows best, but that is an interesting point. To each of these you can tell is, what is the dabba, what is the dukhan? And again, we're, we're, we're going to get to it one by one. So where were we? We said the dukhan, the dajjal, uh, the dabba. Number uh, four, the rising of the sun from the west. So the sun rises in the east, sets in the west. One day it will rise from the west. Number five, Nuzulu Isa ibn Maryam. The coming down of Isa ibn Maryam. Okay, this is a specific incident. And that is not ambiguous at all. Very clear. Number six, Ya'juj and Ma'juj. And the coming of Ya'juj and Ma'juj. Okay, that is a major sign. And we'll talk about them and some of the problems that are raised by this issue. We'll talk about it very frankly when we get to inshallah. Number seven, eight, and nine, three zalazil, three earthquakes that will shake the world. There's going to be major. This isn't a regional earthquake. These are earthquakes that essentially the world will know it is an earthquake. Three zalazil that will shake the world in one hadith. Each next one will be bigger than the first one. So it's going to be three consecutive earthquakes that are the whole world will know that there is an earthquake uh, taking place. And then he said, Wa The last of these signs, number 10, the last of these signs is a blazing fire that will emanate in Yemen and will force the people towards Ard al Mahshar or the land of resurrection. The land of resurrection. The very last sign of judgment day will be the fire that will force people to gather in one place and that will be the end of humanity in that one place which is going to be in Bilad al-Sham as we will come to when we come to it. In another hadith he said, any time one of these ten comes, expect the other to come immediately after. So these ten are like dominoes, one after the other. These ten, when the first one comes, khalas, the rest are going to follow very, very quickly. And the first of these ten, without a doubt, is the coming of Isa ibn Maryam. This is the first of these ten. The first of these ten is the coming of Isa ibn Maryam. And when Isa comes, the rest of these are going to come one by one. And that's it. Qiyamah will take place very shortly after the coming of Isa ibn Maryam. And the last of the minor signs links the first of the major signs. Let me repeat. The last of the minor signs links the first of the major signs. The last of the minor signs is the coming of the Mahdi. The coming of the Mahdi is the last of the minor signs. And the Mahdi will be alive and will interact with the first of the major signs. And that is who? Isa ibn Maryam. So the Mahdi and the Isa will coexist at the same time, same place, interact with one another. And it is literally as if the minor is coming to an end and the major is beginning. And then that's it. The rest will go uh, from there until Qiyamah. So... For the rest of today, and inshallah, our next lecture on Wednesday, we'll be discussing some of the primary minor signs. Now, I want to make a, a point here. While I have done a somewhat exhaustive list, it is not possible to do an encyclopedic list that would take at least four to six weeks of lectures and also into a lot of detail about various narrations and how authentic they are. So what I have done, I have culled it from the primary books that I have. The major, uh, not the major science, the word major is not problematic to use because we're talking about minor. The more significant of the minor science, let's put it that way, okay? So by no stretch is this list fully comprehensive. And I have told you about uh, one of the most comprehensive books, some say it is the most encyclopedic book ever written, and it is Kitab al Fitan by the famous scholar of hadith of the fourth century, Nu'aym ibn Hamad. It has over, um, don't quote me on this, a thousand something narrations about the signs of Judgment Day. These are, he wrote a book of hadith. He's in the classical time frame. He isn't some modern guy. He's in the time of right after Bukhari. So he's writing every hadith with his isnad to the Prophet wasallam, and it is a massive comp, uh, a compendium that was recently, uh, very recently edited 
edited and published, they came across a manuscript copy. Otherwise, it was uh, missing for many uh, centuries, but uh, they, they came across it and it was recently printed. This is a massive encyclopedia. That's not going to be done in just two or three lectures. So, let us begin, inshallah, talking about some of the more significant of these minor signs. And I will try my best to use uh, authentic hadith. Uh, and we will come to the topic of weak hadith eventually as well and you will hear my position about them which is the position of the vast majority of the scholars of our religion uh, including Imam al nawi and Ibn Taymiyyah and others who said that weak hadith uh, hadith that are not 100% authentic they may be used with a number of conditions They're, you must have some conditions attached to them no classical scholar completely rejected weak hadith this is actually a modern opinion uh, of the classical ulama and the medieval ulama Da'if hadith was only accepted with a number of conditions. One of them being you point out this hadith is weak. And so you have a warning that you know what? Like not, not a warning but a gray, like a gray light big, or a yellow light. Be cautious, right? That, that's what it is. So some of these will be weak but most of these and when it is I'll point it out. Otherwise the default whatever you hear me say in these lists is authentic hadith insha'Allah ta'ala. The first of the minor signs already mentioned and that is the birth of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And the da'wah and the message of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and the death of our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. This all together, let's just say, is the first of the signs of Judgment Day. This is where it all begins. And that's why he said, بُعِثْتُ أَنَا وَالسَّاعَكَ هَاتَيْنِ Myself and Judgment Day, we came like this. Notice, myself and Judgment Day. He's putting himself as the first sign because he is the first sign. And in the other hadith, Allah sent the both of us together and I just beat it. I just beat it by a little bit. That hadith is in Muslim Imam Ahmed. So he is the first and the beginning of all of the minor signs of uh, Judgment Day. Of the minor signs that are mentioned in at least a dozen different hadith, and this is a collection, I'm not going to go over all of them. So this is a point here. At least a dozen hadith of the minor signs is the prediction that the Sahaba themselves would fight each other. This is an authentic narration, a number of authentic narrations that the Sahaba themselves would be fighting one another. And once the sword was lifted, the, the Muslim Ummah would continually be fighting until Judgment Day. And that's why Hudayfa said to Umar, what are you worried? It's not going to happen in your lifetime. It's going to happen after you. Don't worry, it's not going to happen in your, in your lifetime. And that's why Uthman radiallahu anhu, when he was surrounded by those evil people, he said, I'm not going to be the one to open that sword. That was the famous phrase he said, I will not be that one to unsheathe the sword because whoever is the first to do it, it will never be put back in. You remember that fame? We'll go, inshallah, one day we'll give a lecture about the death of Uthman. It's a very emotional lecture. That famous phrase, why did he say, I will not be the one who unsheathes the sword? Because he knew and he said this, whenever it is taken out, it's never going to go back in. He knew this. And we saw what happened when those evil people, the Khawarij, they killed Uthman radiallahu anh, and they then started what they started. They were the ones who caused Sifin and Jamal and all of those things and all of that trials and tribulations. And once it happened, subhanAllah, up until our times, the Ummah has been uh, divided. So this is a genre of predictions that there's going to be infighting physical fighting amongst the Muslims with that they will be divided and they will go to war with one another and they will shed the blood of one another and this is one of those things the Prophet was saddened by in the famous hadith he said I asked Allah this hadith is a Muslim I asked Allah for three things he gave me two of them and he did not give me one by the way this hadith is so powerful even our Prophet Sallallahu he does not have a haqq that whatever I say happens only Allah says, Kun fayakun. Only Allah. Even the Habib, the Mustafa, the Ahmad, the Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, even he cannot demand, he can ask. And it is up to Allah. Hadith is in Thai Muslim. Sa'altu Rabbi thalathan fa'atani ithnain wa man'ani wahid. He gave me two and he denied me one. What did he give me? What did he deny? I asked him to never cause an external enemy to come and eliminate my ummah. He gave it to me. Never will the ummah be destroyed in its entirety. You might have a section. You might have our brothers here, our sisters there. But the ummah as a whole, and our Prophet said, some ummahs before us were destroyed by external enemies. 
So he made a dua to Allah. Oh Allah, let my ummah be protected so that external enemies will never eliminate all of them. Allah said, you have it. He said, oh Allah, let no disease or plague eliminate my entire ummah because some of the previous ummahs, something happened internally. You know, the black death or whatever you call this, you know, some type of disease or virus and the whole ummah was eliminated. So Allah gave it to him. Never will the ummah be eliminated because of an internal disease. Then the third one, he said, Oh Allah, let my ummah not fight one another. And Allah did not give me that. Allah Azza wa Jal is the one, he says, Kun fayakun. La yus'alu amma yaf'al. This is in the Quran. No one can challenge Allah for what Allah decides. Wahum yus'alun. You will be asked what you do. No one can ask Allah, why did you do something? For a wisdom known to Allah, he did not give this to our Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So this is one genre, the fighting of the ummah, internal fighting. Another predictions of the minor signs of judgment day. And this is at least five hadith in this regard, if not more. He predicted explicitly the martyrdom of Umar radiallahu an and Uthman radiallahu an and he implied pretty much explicitly or you can say implicitly that Abu Bakr as-Siddiq would not die as a martyr but he would die a natural death that of a Siddiq right and there are many hadith in this regard and again Hudayfa understood this again remember Hudayfa is the one who said oh you will not die a natural death the door will be broken how did he know the Prophet did not mention names, but the concept was there. In the famous hadith reported in Sahih Muslim, that once the Prophet was with Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman, and they were walking on the mountain of Uhud. They were walking on the mountain of Uhud, and Uhud began to tremble. It began to shake. And our Prophet ﷺ, he took his foot and he tapped it. And he said, Uthbut Uhud. Calm down, Uhud. Some say it was trembling in awe. I have on me all of these people is trembling in awe. By the way, another tangent, side point. Those of you who know, you know. I have all of these tangents. We believe that inanimate objects have consciousness. This is something that's a part of our faith. We believe the walls, the stones, the sun, the moon, they have a type of consciousness different than our own. Not like us. I'm not saying they see, hear, but they are aware. And by the way, many modern philosophies and many theories of physics and biology also prove this. Plants and whatnot, they have a type of consciousness. A type, again, not like ours. And this is proven in so many ayat and hadith. Of them is... وَإِمِّنْ شَيْءٍ إِلَّا يُسَبِّ بِحَمْدِهِ Nothing is there except that it praises Allah. The sun praises Allah. The moon praises Allah. These are inanimate objects. How can they praise Allah? They have consciousness. Of them, when the Prophet picked up the stones, and the stones, the Sahaba said, we heard the stone say, SubhanAllah. We heard it say, SubhanAllah. When it was in the hand of the Prophet, Hadith in Sahih Muslim. Of them, the famous Hadith in Bukhari, that when the Prophet was giving the khutbah on that, on that, on that mimbar, made out of the, the trunk of the tree. Then he had a fancy three-step constructed. He left it. Allah allowed the trunk of the tree, its expressions to be heard. Not that the expressions were not there, but Allah allowed the Sahaba to hear how the tree felt. Think about that, right? The tree was feeling something. If Allah had willed, just like now, we cannot hear the sun, the moon, the trees, the stars. We cannot hear the walls. At that point in time, Allah blessed the Sahaba to hear, to be on the same wavelength of communication as this trunk tree. So they heard it in a language that they understand. And they said, we heard it sobbing. In one narration, like a, a baby boy. In another narration, like a camel that has been separated from its mother. It was sobbing, sobbing, sobbing. This was the expression that Allah gave to the ears of the Sahaba so that they could understand how the tree felt. You understand this point, right? Obviously, the tree is expressing in its own language, its own wavelength, but we are deaf to that. So Allah blessed the Sahaba. So what did the Prophet do? He interrupted the khutbah and he came down and he hugged the tree. Even inanimate objects feel the love. He hugged the tree and he patted it to calm it down. 
even inanimate objects. And then he ordered that the tree be dug out and be buried right where he stood. And to this day, it is buried under the mimbar that the Prophet ﷺ used. The point is, all of this shows inanimate objects. They have what? They have... You guys listening? What do they have? Consciousness. They can understand. They can accept what is going on in their own way. So Allah allowed Uhud to express how it felt. Awe, trembling. And the Prophet said, calm down. Don't worry. Uthbut ya Uhud. فَإِنَّمَا عَلَيْكَ نَبِيٌّ وَصِدِّيقٌ وَشَهِيدَيْنِ You only have a Nabi, a Siddiq, and two Shaheeds on you. Don't worry. You only have a Nabi, a Siddiq, and two Shaheeds. Notice, he predicted here. Everybody understands. He is the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq, and then Umar and Uthman, they both die as Shaheeds. Siddiq is higher. He died on his deathbed. He didn't need to die like the Shaheed. He is higher than that. Siddiq. And then Shaheedain. So he's predicting also in the famous narration as well that uh, Abu Musa al-Ash'ari uh, was uh, with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he followed him uh, and the Prophet sallallahu went into the garden of one of the Ansar whom he knew that the Prophet uh, knew that the Ansari would not mind him coming in. It was a public garden. So he walked in and he sat down in contemplation. Abu Musa al-Ash'ari said, I will volunteer to be the the doorman of the Prophet, the guard of the Prophet. I don't want anybody to disturb him when he's in his ibadah. So he went outside and he stood outside of the garden. So when he went outside, Abu Bakr came. Where is the Prophet? He's inside. Can I go inside? Let me ask him. He went inside. Ya Rasulullah, Abu Bakr is at the door. Can he come in? Yes, tell him to come in and tell him that he shall enter Jannah. Okay, alhamdulillah. Umar, the same thing. Uthman. The same thing, but then after a calamity that will befall him. Ba'da musibatin, after a musibah he will be tested with, then he will enter Jannah. So the fitan began in the time of Uthman. And that's what Hudayfa said. Oh, Umar, don't worry, you're not going to see the musibah that's going to be a community musibah. The assassination of Umar was a one off, one deranged lunatic, one Majusi assassinated. It wasn't a conspiracy, there wasn't a mob. One crazy person went and killed our Khalifa Umar al Khattab. As for Uthman radiallahu anhu, what happened? Mob mentality. Break, break up of the unity of the Ummah. That's why he said, after a calamity, a major issue that's going to affect him. And in the famous hadith in the Mustadak of Al Hakim, our Prophet said to Uthman, that, O oh Uthman, Allah Azza wa Jal will give you a shirt to wear. And others will come wanting to snatch that shirt away from you. But do not give them that shirt until Allah Himself takes it away. Do we all understand what this means? This is a prediction. Now, did Uthman radiallahu understand this when it was said? Maybe he, did, maybe he didn't. But he clearly understood it in his khilafah. When, and that's why I said cryptic wording. This is of the points of predictions of judgment. They are cryptic. What shirt? What is going on? Why is this shirt being mentioned? Maybe, maybe Uthman radiallahu himself did not understand what does the shirt mean. But definitely... In the time of his khilafah, now he knows. And that is one of the reasons he did not budge. Because he knew if he gave them an inch, they would take a foot. If he gave them a foot, they would do much more than this. So he did not budge and he did the right thing and he died a shaheed. But the Prophet said, he's going to be tested. Balwa. Balwa means a, a calamity of a big nature. So the Sahaba understood in Uthman's time, the door will be opened. And that's when the, uh, the issues will take place. So this is the genre of predicting Abu Bakr, Umar and Uthman radiallahu anhum's uh, death. Another prediction is the prediction of the battle of the camel. And the battle of the camel was one of the most tragic battles. No, let me rephrase. It was the most tragic battle of early Islam, of the time of the Sahaba. There is no exception. It was the most heart-wrenching battle because, well, like, who can you, you cannot choose sides. How can you choose sides? And that's why when somebody, uh, uh, what is the battle of the Jamal? The battle of the Jamal, on one side you have Aisha and Talha and Zubair radiallahu anhum. On the other side you have Ali ibn Abi Talib and many of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. How do you choose sides here? The battle of the Jamal. And this is why when Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal was asked, 
What happened during that time? Which side should we have taken? Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal died 240 Hijrah, 200 years after the Battle of the Camel, the Battle of the Jamal. It's called the Battle of the Camel because Aisha radiallahu anha, she was on a camel that had a mini tent. You know, our mothers, they were not allowed to be seen at all. Unlike other ladies, they can be seen in hijab. Our mothers, the wives of the Prophet they cannot even be seen in hijab. They have to be in a mini tent. No one can even see the outer shape of our mother. This is a special commandment only for them. And so when they were, uh, when she was on the camel, she was in something called a haudaj. And the haudaj is the uh, mini tent on the camel. And so everybody could see the camel bobbing up and down and in the middle. And so they called it, and, and usually you don't see a woman's tent in the middle of the battlefield, right? So that's why it's called the battle of the camel. Because in that battle, there was a camel with the Aisha radiallahu anha's tent on it. And uh, Imam Ahmed was asked about that battle. And he said, that was a battle. Allah saved our swords from having to have blood. So why don't we save our tongues from having to have sides? That was a battle. Alhamdulillah, we didn't have to pick our swords. We weren't alive back then. I wasn't forced to choose sides. So then why are you dragging my tongue in and making me force and pick sides now? Let me be quiet. And this, by the way, is pure Sunni theology. We stay quiet about what happened between the Sahaba and we don't discuss it in a lot of detail. We don't bring up he said, she said. We don't let it be. Tilka ummatun qad khalat. Radiyallahu anhum wa radu an. And some other groups, they love to discuss this and that and this and that. And what happens? The heart becomes hard and no benefit happens. There were people who were righteous. They had a misunderstanding. And what happened, happened and life goes on. We don't dwell on the past. So Imam Ahmad said, I don't want to talk about it. My tongue will remain silent about it. But our Prophet predicted the battle of the Jamal. Hadith is in Mustadrahi of Al Hakim, and it is a Hassan hadith. And in fact, there are three other hadith, Tabarani, and others, so it's an authentic hadith. That, and why this hadith is so bizarre. The first time I read it, I couldn't believe this is many years ago. I couldn't believe this so explicit. I actually looked it up in the Mustadrahi of Al Hakim to make sure that with the book I was reading didn't, you know, change some words or whatnot. I went to the original to look it up. So, uh, in this, uh, in the hadith, uh, Aisha radiallahu anha and Ali radiallahu an are sitting in the same room as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says to Ali radiallahu an, O oh Ali, what will you do when there will be an issue between you and her? What will you do on that time when there's going to be some issue? So he said, Ya Rasulullah, me? Aisha, how? How? I will be the worst of the two, or the, not the better of the two. Means, no, no, that's not going to happen. I'm not going to do that. So the Prophet ﷺ said that when it does happen, then return her from where she came from safely. Bring her back and take her where she came from safely. And that is why Ali radiallahu an, after the battle of the camel, he sent his own daughters and he sent the noble ladies of Medina as bodyguards. Women, he sent them. Meaning the internal bodyguard, then you have the external convoy, obviously. They have the internal, like nobody should interact with the women. He sent his own daughters and he sent the noble ladies of, I said Medina, Kufa, sorry. Kufa. He sent them from Kufa all the way back to Medina to return Aisha to Medina. And then he brought the ladies back and he left Aisha there. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ said, perhaps a day will come when there will be something between you and her. When that day happens, then you, O Ali, radiallahu an, you take her back to her place safe and sound. And he did exactly as he was commanded and he returned Aisha exactly what the Prophet ﷺ said, uh, told him to do. Also, the Prophet ﷺ predicted the battle of Safin. And Safin was another tragedy. In some ways, it was a worse tragedy than Jamal. Both were tragedies. Jamal was the tragedy because you had Ashra Mubashra on both sides. That's painful. That's painful. You had Ashra Mubashra on both sides. And by the way, one of the benefits of the battle of Jamal and Safin and subhanAllah, it's so beautiful because even in problems, there is good. Even in some negatives and evils, there is khair that you can derive. One of the khair that we derive, righteous people sometimes have arguments. Good people can disagree. People of Jannah 
people of Jannah cannot get along in this world sometimes. That's a benefit for us to know. That you know, it's possible. It's possible that sometimes you get into an argument and you're both good people. And subhanAllah, I mean, this is a complete different tangent, but again, it's important to know uh, marriage and divorce is another reality. If somebody has a divorce, doesn't mean that one of the two sides is bad. Maybe both of them are people of Jannah. Maybe both of them are going to go to Jannah. You don't have to get along, you know, in this world to be a participant. Obviously, it's better to, but it's not a necessary requirement. Sometimes people are tested and righteous people were tested. So much so they went to war with one another. And yet they're both people of Jannah. Subhanallah, this is, this is Allah's sunnah. So the point is that the Prophet predicted the battle of Safin as well. How so? How did he predict the battle of Safin? The hadith is in Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. It is the most authentic hadith imaginable. The most authentic hadith imaginable. And it's a famous hadith. You've all heard it. The Prophet was on the minbar and he's giving the khutbah. And his grandson, Hassan radiallahu anhu, who's probably three years old at this time, two or three years old, he comes in and he was wearing a red thobe. And you know, in those days, they didn't have much money. So they would put clothes on their kids that was longer than what they needed because they could then grow up. You know, they weren't as fine-tuned as us. One to two months, you go to the baby, Walmart, whatever, the Toys R Us, babies are, then three to four months, then six to... Every few weeks, you buy a new outfit for your kid. No, they didn't have that luxury. They didn't have that. They would just have to. So they put a thobe that went below to the floor because they want him to grow up and use it for some time. So Hassan radiallahu an he came out of the house of Fatima radiallahu an and you know how little toddlers are he sees his grandfather on the on the mimbar so he rushes forward and what's going to happen he tripped on his own thobe and he fell and smacked his head and he began crying in the middle of the masjid subhanallah by the way this is the humanity wallahi sometimes we don't imagine you know these are human beings Hassan radiallahu was a baby at this time and babies cry so he fell and he cried. Now, the Sahaba are told to listen and be respectful of the khutbah. What are they going to do now? Who's going to stand up? I mean, what are you going to do? On the one hand, you know the authentic hadith that don't do anything when the imam is giving the khutbah, right? You sami'na wa and you hear and you obey. On the other hand, Hassan radiallahu himself is crying. What to do? The Sahaba just stood there, froze. So the Prophet Sallallahu himself, he came down, stopped the khutbah. He came down, walked between the Sahaba, and he picked up Hassan, calmed him down, radiallahu anhu, walked back up, and he said that I was not able to contain my anxiety when my son was crying. He called him his son. When my son was crying, and you know, every parent knows this. Every parent knows this, you know, that when your child is crying, your concentration is out, you know. In the salah time, you know, mothers know this, fathers know this, that, you know, you, you, you recognize, those of you that don't have kids, by the way, believe you me, right now all kids sound alike to you. When you have your kid, you shall recognize him and the, or his or her cry from amongst a thousand cries, you will know this is my kid. And that's why Allah says in the Quran about the Yahud, يَعْرِفُونَهُ كَمَا يَعْرِفُونَ أَبْنَاءَهُمْ as they recognize their own children. The recognition of children is something totally different. Anyway, where was I? What was I talking about? Hassan. Hassan radiallahu anhu, the Prophet picked him up, brought him back. Now, listen to this. He kissed him on the mimbar and he lifted him up. There's a famous hadith, Bukhari and Muslim. He lifted him up. This is the leader, right? All other later motifs are coming from here. He lifted him up and he said, this son of mine, and he called him a son, even though he's a grandson. This is an honor for Hassan. This son of mine is a leader. Sayyid here means leader. This son of mine is a leader. And a time will come when he shall be the cause of reconciling between two large groups of Muslims. Now this hadith is so profound. And I have to gloss over it. But the Prophet did not criticize either side. Notice. 
unlike another trend in our ummah that thinks that they are on one side versus the other and we respectfully disagree without riling up any hatred but we disagree we don't agree with that trend we are on both sides even though we respect one side as closer to the truth than other but we do not disrespect the other side and we get this from where from our prophet he didn't say this son will reconcile between muslim and kafir audhu billah he didn't say between Muslim and Fajr, between guided and misguided. No. What did he say? Between two great groups of Muslims. And we know what happened between Muawiyah radiallahu an and Ali radiallahu an. They were fighting, fighting, fighting. At the death of Ali radiallahu an, Hassan took charge for a few months. Muawiyah for Maslaha known to him decided to have one more attack and Hassan said you know what enough is enough you keep it and khalas go and I'm going to withdraw and because of that the ummah united and this is the true leader not the one who sits on the kursi the one who unites the ummah was called the leader imagine that not the figurehead who is great we respect him he is a sahabi but you cannot compare him with Hassan radiallahu There is no comparison aslan. The real leader in the metaphorical sense, not in the political sense. Politically, yes, the leader of the Umayyads was the leader. But the real leader was the one who stepped back and said, Khalas, you have it. Enough bloodshed. Let us be one. And that's what the Prophet called him the leader. Also, the prediction is given as well uh, in the famous hadith in uh, Sahih Muslim. That, whose is this? Uh, can you turn, turn that off? That uh, Ali radiallahu an was fighting uh, the Kharijites. So, there, so Ali fought multiple wars. He fought in the battle of Jamal. This is predicted. He fought in the battle of Safin. This is predicted. He also fought the Kharijites. And the Kharijites are the first sect to break away from the Ummah. The first fanatic group to break away. And they consider themselves holier and better than everybody else. And he fought the Kharijites and he won them. Then he said... Go find somebody who has a deformity of the hand and he described in vivid detail. There's going to be a protrusion, there's going to be a black spot. He described in vivid detail. Go find somebody with that uh, deformity amongst the dead. So they went once, they said, Oh Amir al-Mu'neen, we didn't find this person. He said, no, you didn't look. Go look again. So they went for a second time and they scoured every dead body before they buried him. Before they buried And they didn't find They said Oh Amir al We looked at every dead body We didn't find this sign He said Go for a third time For wallahi I know what I heard And neither Was the person Who said this to me a liar Nor was I lied to In other words The one who said it Spoke the truth And I know what I heard So now he got angry He said Go and do it I know what I heard The one who said this Is not a liar And I heard the truth Go find this man so they went and they found that there were two people who were actually covering a third body. And because of that, they hadn't found the third body. So when they pulled the purple, they said, oh, here is it. And they found that, that same deformity. And they said, oh, here he is. Ya Amir al He said, Allahu Akbar. I know I heard the truth. The Prophet told me I would fight. And he described the groups of people, the Kharijites. And he said, their leader will be a person. Described him and the deformity was there. This hadith is in Sahih Muslim. Imagine how specific of a narration. Where Ali radiallahu an, he knows he has to fight this, this fringe group. And he knows that this is a wrong group. And that their leader is going to have this deformity. And he's so confident. Three times they come, they say, we didn't find this guy. No, go, I know what I heard. And the one who said this to me is not a liar. Don't accuse me of anything. I know what I heard. So then they found the man. This is a prediction, is it not? It is one of the signs of judgment day. That Ali radiallahu an is going to be fighting this group of the uh, Kharijites. And uh, we already mentioned the battle of Safin. There's one more hadith. I forgot to mention it. Uh, this hadith is in Sahih um, uh, Sahih uh, Muslim and uh, Sahih Bukhari Muttafaq Ali Hadith that the Prophet ﷺ said Qiyamah will not come until a large war takes place Qital takes place between two groups of Muslims who have the same call Da'wahuma Wahid they have the same call and yet they're still having a major war now this Hadith is cryptic 
but almost by unanimous consensus. Our later scholars have understood this to be the Battle of Safin and or the Battle of Jamal or both. Why? Because it was the only point in time where in reality, theologically, methodologically, and religiously, both sides were on par with one another. In almost every battle after this, generally speaking, it is very different. But in that time frame, there were no theological differences between these two camps. They didn't differ about salah, zakah, hajj, aqidah. Ironically, and not ironically, it is authentically mentioned that during the battles of Safin, at the night time, sometimes the two warrior camps would pray to hajj under the same imam. Because there's no difference in aqidah. And once a person came to Ali radiallahu anhu and said, is Muawiyah radiallahu an uh, a kafir? He said this to him. And he said, A'udhu billah. Muawiyah ran away from kufr. How can he be a kafir? So he said to Ali, then why are you fighting him? How can you be fighting him? So Ali radiallahu anhu said, I pray in my duas that me and Muawiyah are like the ones whom Allah said in the Quran, وَنَزَعْنَا مَا فِي صُدُورِهِم مِّنْ غِلٍّ إِخْوَانًا عَلَى سُرِّمْ وَتَقَابِلِينَ We have removed the animosity between them and they are now brothers in Jannah facing one another. He said, this is my dua to Allah that me and Muawiyah رضي الله عنه are this ayah. Notice, they're fighting one another in the day but at night they are making this dua to one another. And there are also stories mentioned about Muawiyah as well that he did not allow certain things as well that were of a crude nature. So the point being that... Uh, the process of saying two massive groups will fight and they have the same call. When did this happen? It happened during the time of the uh, Sahaba. Uh, a number of other predictions are given as well. I know time is, is limited, so I'm going to go two, three more and then inshallah we'll open the floor for some Q&A and then inshallah we'll continue next week. Uh, one other prediction that was truly very bizarre. And this prediction is one of those that increases our iman, that our Prophet is speaking from Allah Azza wa Jal. Hadith is in Sahih Bukhari. When Ammar ibn Yasir was almost tortured to death, when his father Yasir, his mother Sumayya were massacred, when Bilal was being dragged through the streets and his flesh being used with hot combs, some of the Sahaba came to the Prophet and complained, Ya Rasulullah, for how long will this happen? And the Prophet ﷺ was sitting in the shade of the Kaaba after Salat al-Dhuhr, hot. And there's a little bit of shade after Dhuhr, he's sitting there. And he was lying, not lying, but you know, with his back on the Kaaba. And they're around him. And they said, for how long, Ya Rasulullah? When they said this, he stood, not stood up, but he came up. And he said, how quickly and hastily you guys lose hope. How hasty you are. How hasty you are. Fawallahi, it's only a matter of time when a lady will come from Sana'a to Hadramaut with her flock of sheep, fearing none except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then the wolf attacking her sheep. Now, this is a very bizarre and yet explicit hadith. How so? He is telling them that in their own lifetime, yushikanna means literally, it's just going to happen. Yani washak in Arabic means, it's just going to happen. It's not going to happen after decades and centuries, it's going to happen now. In your own lifetime, it's going to happen. That a lady, now in those days, there is no central government. Ladies do not travel on their own. We all know the hadith prohibiting that from those time frames. Whether it's applicable now or not is a fiqhi discussion. We'll come to it someday, inshallah. But definitely the hadith are there for that time frame, for their own safety. You don't have a lady traveling alone, especially between two cities. But the Prophet said, it's only a matter of time where a new government will arise that will give so much security and safety that the furthest nether regions of this land, and that's Sana'a and Hadramaut. So Sana'a and Hadramaut, imagine, we are in Dallas here, imagine if somebody said, between Vancouver and Seattle, far, far away, this is the analogy, right? Far, far away. Between, we are in the center here. 
I'd like to say Dallas is the center, huh? This is our center now. We are in the center, physically, metaphorically, intellectually, inshallah. Maybe even politically, things are heading. Allah knows where. Let's not go there. But anyway, uh, our state has a unique law. And anyway, let's not go down that tangent. Okay. Where am I? Center of the world? Hadramaut. We're in Hadramaut. Yes. Okay. He mentions two cities far, far away. Why? To signify how powerful that new government is going to be. That it shall bring peace and security to the nether regions. To a young lady. And young ladies, generally speaking, wolves prey on them amongst the men, pray amongst them the most. But there will be no cause of fear. And what will she be scared of in her own personal life? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then she's worried about wolves and foxes attacking her sheep. You're worried about physically being beaten to death because you're a Muslim. And I am telling you, a time will come when there will be so much security that no one will fear the robber, the highway robber, the thief. And as we know, in the time of the Sahaba, this happened and it was manifested many, many times. This is a prediction that no one could have ever made when the Sahaba are being cut to pieces. And our Prophet ﷺ says, we shall be safe. Just be patient. One generation, not even one generation. And that is exactly what happened in their own lifetimes. The Sahaba saw the coming of this peace and this security. And with this, inshallah, we will. The question is that, the, there's a slight, slight rephrase, there are some hadith that tell us to avoid the fitan when Muslims fight. And how do we understand this in light of the Sahaba fighting? Realize that when the Sahaba fought, there were actually three camps. There was the group of Ali radiallahu an, there was the group of Muawiyah radiallahu an. And then there was a small third category that refused to take part. And this was the elite of the elite, the krem de la krem. The likes of Abdullah ibn Abbas, the likes of Abdullah ibn Umar. They did not participate in either side. And somebody came to Ibn Abbas and said, are you in the camp of Ali or in the camp of Muawiyah radiallahu anhu? He said, I'm in the camp of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay, so he refused to take sides here. If you can give us one more meditation, let's keep it related. But inshallah, you're a very important question. We will inshallah answer it in one of the Tuesday sessions. Jazakumullah khair. Inshallah, we'll continue next Tuesday at...